for 60 years, and they have, they have given seven Nobel Prizes for solving the Palestine question. And it's no better. In fact, it's worse than it was in 1948. So seven people have won the Nobel Prize for working on it, and still nothing. Enough already. It's time to start talking about a viable truce for another 50 or 60 years. Because no one in Palestine, no Arab and no Jew or no Zionist, can sign anything that's permanent, that has a smell of being permanent. They just, they just cannot do it. So, but they will negotiate something that says we won't kill each other and that, that we will punish people on both sides that do any killing. So I say, for heaven's sake, stop talking about peace. I've sent an advice to the present, to the coming government. Just don't use the word peace in Palestine ever. Talk about truce. And then we might be able to get somewhere to stopping all the killing on both sides. And the vast majority of people on both sides desperately want the cessation of killing at least. But the uh, small, very violent minority don't want anything except all of it for them and their side. And so it's an impossible situation. Now let's get back to the question, to the question of the Middle East. First of all, this is a map of Islam in the world. The ten largest nations of Islam. Indonesia is the largest Muslim nation in the world. The second is India, Hyderabad here. The third is Pakistan and the fourth Bangladesh. The fifth is central, the former Soviet Union. There are now a whole bunch of different countries, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, uh, uh, Girgizia, and Kazakhstan. But China is then the next. After China, uh, Egypt, after Egypt, Iran, then Turkey, then Nigeria. These are the 10 largest Muslim populations in the world. But you would see here with the dark green where the, uh, where the Shias are, largely in Iran, in Azerbaijan, and in southern Iraq, and, and in central Afghanistan. That, and there are a few down here in Yemen. But that's where most of the, the Shias. At one time, the, the, in the Fatimid period, all of this area was, was Shia. And at one time, even Baghdad was ruled by Shia. So that um, the, uh, this, the politics have changed considerably. But this will give you some idea of where Islam is in the world. And there are now significant populations in every almost every country in Europe of Muslims. And of course, when I was in school, at, when I was in university, we had 35,000 Muslims in the census in the United States. And now there are anywhere from three to five or six million Muslims in this country. The vast majority of them are uh, immigrants or the children of immigrants and, and a very few converts. There is also something, there's something called black Muslims in this country who are followers of Elijah Muhammad. And, uh, and they are not accepted as real Muslims by the vast majority of Muslims. They are not allowed to go on the pilgrimage without uh, going to uh, uh, get training and special permission from the uh, Arabic University at Azhar in Cairo, which is the oldest university in the world, 1,000 years old. So when uh, Mal Malcolm X went on the pilgrimage, he came to Beirut to make up his mind and um, uh, stayed with friends of mine and wanted to talk to somebody about Islam, wanted to ask questions to some American that he could understand. And they brought me in. He said, I'm not talking to any damn honky about Islam. And uh, she, Mrs. Hope said, uh, well, uh, his hostess said, well, you sit in the bedroom, and I'll at, and you ask the question, write it down, and he'll answer. Well, I wasn't halfway through the first question, answer, when he was in my face with that finger. So I spent five days trying to explain the difference between Shia and Sunni. But what he was most interested in is how does a mosque work? They don't take up a collection. There's no paid preacher. Uh, how does it work? Well, it works by inheritance. If you build a mosque, you have to put enough property aside to support that mosque. And so people don't pay to go to the mosque, and there's no collection taken up, and uh, there are no paid preachers in Islam. 
a, a teacher or a judge or a, or a uh, jurisprudence uh, consultant uh, can be the one that does the, the sermon and so forth. So, but Islam is not the problem in the Middle East. Now we come to a, a very interesting thing. In the last 40 years, and I've been in the Middle East off and on now since 1950, that's 58 years, and in the last about 40 of those years, there has been a huge revival of the practice of Islam throughout the world. Only 15% of Muslims are Arabs. So the vast majority are outside of the Arab world. And in Africa, the Muslims are converting pagans five to one over the Christian missionaries in Africa. And, uh, and uh, so the uh, Islam is not the problem at all, but there's this huge revival, and it's across the board. There are Sufis or mystics, the sort of the Quakers of Islam, uh, and there are many more today. There are ra rather orthodox uh, uh, Muslims, uh, the, sort of the mainstream Muslims, and there are a whole lot of Islam as beautiful reactionary Muslims, uh, and there's a whole lot of identity crisis in Islam. But this revival is something that we don't hear about here in this country. One more thing I would like to talk about quickly. This is the rainfall in the Arab world. Doesn't that paint a picture? Notice that average rainfall in Washington is about 40 inches. I think it's about almost twice that here in East Tennessee. But look here how little rainfall there is in most of the Arab world, most of the Muslim world. So that's an interesting picture. Before World War I, a Mr. Sykes, a member of the Foreign Office of Britain, and a Mr. Pico, a Foreign Office of France, and a Russian ambassador got together and made an agreement of what they were going to do with the, with the Ottoman Empire when, when they took it. They didn't have it then. And I'm talking about 1915, they made the Sykes-Picot Agreement, and they didn't capture uh, a large part of the Ottoman Empire until 1918. These are the names of the main things I'm going over there. So uh, the Sykes-Picot Agreement divided up the Middle East between Russia. Russia was to get, guess what, warm water access to the Mediterranean. The Bosphorus and the Dardanelles are much closer than looks to you. It's only a couple of miles, so it's, it's, not, it's not that wide. And the Sea of Barmer in the middle. They were to get Istanbul, or Constantinople is written here, it shouldn't be. And uh, they were to get a place so they could, they could get out to the sea even in the wintertime, because Russia's always wanted a warm water port. And the Greeks were to get western Anatolia, the Italians were to get the southern part, and the Turks would be to allow this. Remember that the Turks have not always lived in, in Asia Minor. They only came there in the 15th century. This was part of the Eastern Roman Empire and spoke Greek from about 527 until, 19, uh, until 1918. So um, that's the, the sykes pee creole Agreement divided up. Then the French were to get Syria and they were to get Kurdistan and they were to get uh, as, as mandates. The mandate means a legal colonial, le illegal colony supported by the League of Nations. And the British were to get Palestine, which included Transjordan, and the southern part of Iraq, Baghdad province, and Baghdad province, and Mosul, and um, uh, Basra province. Mosul up here was to be part of Kurdistan, which was about in here. And the Turks would get almost nothing. So they wrote the Treaty of Sev. You'll see the name over there, Treaty of Sev. Sev is a small suburb between Paris and Versailles. The Treaty of Sev is a part of the Treaty of Versailles. And Sev is a place where they make China. And so people make jokes about the Treaty of Sev is about as, is about as breakable as the, as the China that's made there. But in that period, in that decision, the British and the French, because the Russians had now had a revolution, the British and the French decided that they would divide the world, as I just admit, mentioned, but this area which the Russians were supposed to get would, go, would be internationalized. That's the Treaty of Sev. But then, shortly after that, Lord George loved the Greeks, 
Lloyd George was the Prime Minister of England. He loved the Greeks. And so he encouraged the Greeks to go over here to Smyrna, uh, Izmir it is now, and he took an army, the Greeks took an army, and Ataturk, the hero of Gallipoli, came down with a small army and led the Greeks back up into the interior. When he got them so far that they had no more supplies, he came around behind them and slaughtered them. Then Ataturk moved to, to uh, Smyrna and killed everyone in, in, in his path, all the Greeks in his path. And it was a, it was a huge slaughter. 